Well, for the next three weeks before we begin the Passion Experience, we're beginning a series entitled Jude. That title comes right out of the Bible itself. It is the name of the next to the last letter uh, in the Bible. There's the book of Jude, and then there's the book of Revelation. It's important to note that the book of Jude is only one chapter. So any reference I make today to the book of Jude will be easy to find because there's only one chapter in 25 verses. I will do a collection of those verses, one through seven today, a handful next week, and then wrap up uh, on the uh, final weekend in February with the end of the letter itself. Let me give you a couple of details about the letter that might help us better understand what was going on that Jude was addressing. First, the author is the name of the book, Jude. Now, you might say, well, who is Jude? If you read the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6, verse 3, you'll see that there's a list of Jesus' earthly brothers or or half-brothers. Well, in that list, there is a guy by the name of Judas. Judas is also can be called Jude. When we read the book of Jude, most scholars would agree that Jude is likely the Judas listed in the Gospel of Mark chapter 6 verse 3 as Jesus's half-brother. Why would they think this? Well, internally the book actually refers to Jude as a brother of James who is a half-brother of the Lord Jesus, who also wrote to us the book of James. You say, well, why did he go by Jude instead of Judas? Uh, Most scholars would agree that he did this so we wouldn't confuse him with the traitor, Judas, who handed Jesus over to be crucified. There's some other biblical evidence that would lend us to believe that this is Jude, is the Judas of the Gospel of Mark chapter 6, verse 3, and that also that Jude, along with his brothers, like James, did not believe that Jesus is Lord until after the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you want to search those verses, the Gospel of John chapter 7, verse 5, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 5, and also 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 7, as well as Acts chapter 1, verse 14. If you look at those verses, it appears that Jude, along with James and the other brothers of Jesus, did not recognize Jesus as Lord until after he was raised from the dead. Consider your own life. If you would have been Jesus' brother and you would have walked with him, it might have been difficult to wrap your arms around the fact that your brother is God the Son who is the Son of God, who is God in the flesh. But the resurrection, God used to open their eyes to the truth that Jesus is Lord. The recipients of the letter are likely the same group of Jewish Christians that Peter wrote to. Now, there's some internal evidence that would lend us to come to that conclusion because if you read 1 Peter, 2 Peter, and you read Jude, it appears that they're addressing some of the same issues and using some of the same verbiage. Now, there is debate on whether Jude borrowed from Peter's second letter or Peter borrowed from Jude's letter to address the crowd. Nevertheless, It is likely that Jude and Peter wrote to the same crowd. If not, they both wrote to groups of Jewish Christians. What did Jude actually write about? What was the reason or the purpose for his letter? He was calling the people of God to arms. Uh, He was calling them to get ready for battle. I know, uh, Jerry, you'll appreciate this as a, a, a captain, a former captain in the Navy. Uh, he was calling them to general quarters. Now, I know we have some Air Force and some Army and some Marines. I, I see a Marine nodding because we used to give Marines rides to war. Uh, we were their water taxi to, to get them to war oftentimes, so Marines know what general quarters is. I, I remember the first time I heard this outside of a drill, 
horrified, petrified. I'll go ahead and just tell you I was scared because I had no idea what was getting ready to happen. General quarters is where we're called to if you're in the Navy or a Marine with the Navy at the time so that you would go and man your battle stations. And what it means is there is an imminent threat and the proverbial stuff is getting ready to hit the fan. So get ready. It's getting ready to be on. Here's the way it would happen. Usually, it would take place at an odd hour, like 2 a.m. in the morning when you stood watch all day and you're trying to get sleep. And you would hear this go across the 1MC. That's the intercom system on board a United States warship. General quarters. General quarters. All hands man your battle station. The route of travel is forward and up to starboard, down and aft to port. Set material condition to zebra throughout the ship. The reason for general quarters is war. I'd never heard those words before, no, at least not the last part. I had heard the call to general quarters numerous times because in the military, if you're not at war, you're often preparing and conditioning for war. So we had gone through that drill over and over and over and over again. But never did it strike me the way it did when we were in Desert Storm. It was during a time of ceasefire. A desert Storm was technically over, and they were getting ready uh, Operation Southern Watch had taken place for a while, and we were involved in that conflict, protecting that no-fly zone between Iraq and Iran. And we were getting ready to be released and head back to America. And we were all excited. It was still a potentially volatile area over there. Saddam Hussein, at the time, was still living, and he did not always think straightly. And I remember hearing the general quarters, general quarters, all hands man your battle stations, route of travel forward and up to starboard, down and after port, set material condition to zebra throughout the ship. The reason for general quarters is Saddam Hussein is launching again Scud missiles toward Americans. And man, I'm telling you, the look on people's faces I had never seen before that I had worked with for a couple of years prior to this where we had gone through this drill. But even in the midst of fear on faces, everybody did what they were supposed to do. Why? Because we were prepared. We had gone over it again and again and again and again. And this is what we see in the letter of Jude. What Jude is doing is he's challenging a group, likely of Jewish Christians at the time, but he's challenging the church that he wrote to to be ready for battle because the battle was on. There was a group in the midst of them that was teaching something contrary to God's word and it was bringing confusion within to the ranks and Jude addressed the issue and told the church that they needed to be ready because we are a part of a real battle that takes place in the spiritual realm and infiltrates the physical realm in such a way that the battle is about souls for men, for women, for boys, and for girls. And Satan will use who he can and all resources at his disposal to blind people to the truth. And Jude was calling the church to be ready to recognize those that Satan would use to lead them astray so that they could fully understand the grace of God. Today we'll see three things to help us operate as good soldiers of Jesus Christ, which is what he calls us to be. We're going to see the elect of God. We're going to see the enemies of God. And we're going to see the end with God and or without God. Before we do this, though, let's go to the Lord in a brief word of prayer. Father, please speak to us this morning. And may we understand that the words of Jude are just as real for us today as they were for his audience in the first century. And God, may we be prepared in this battle so that we might do all we can to partner with the Holy Spirit to win as many people as possible so that they could join us in the hope that we have that heaven is our future and forever home. Speak to us this day. 
We pray in Jesus' name, amen. First thing we're going to see as we work through the first seven verses together is we're going to see the elect of God. We're going to see in the passage the elect of God, those that God has clearly called out of the world unto himself, that they would live for him and that they would serve him all the days of their lives. And as we look at the elect, we're going to notice four characteristics. Oftentimes people will say, who are the elect? Well, this letter gives us an idea of how to identify who the elect of God are because it gives us four characteristics of the elect. Look in verses 1 and 2, and then we'll pick them out together. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, to those who have been called who are loved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. First, let's address it. He says, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. Why didn't he just come out and say a brother of Jesus? Most uh, who are convinced that he is referencing a brother of James, who is a half-brother of the Lord Jesus, believe the reason he referred to being a half-brother of James instead of Jesus was purely out of humility. He, He didn't consider himself worthy to have been born to the family that raised the Son of God. So he identified with James, not because he didn't love the Lord Jesus, but out of humility, recognizing the divine nature of his half-brother, he says James instead of Jesus. And what does he give us a picture of? The elect. A in your notes. The first thing we see is the elect are called by God. The elect are called by God. Look again in the verse. It says, to those who have been called. It means called by God. It means those who walk with Jesus are called out of the world into a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there's been an argument since the church really started as far as does everybody receive a call or does only a select few receive a call? I want you to know I firmly believe in the sovereignty of God and that he's fully in control. But I also see in the scripture that man has to choose to follow Jesus. So we won't really get into that argument today. I really like Dr. Warren Wiersbe's thoughts on the calling of God. He writes, the mysteries of God's sovereign electing grace are beyond us in this life and will never fully be understood until we enter the glorious presence. For that reason, we are not wise to make them the basis for arguments or divisions. Here's what I do know from the Word of God. God's fully in control. Also know the Bible says that you must choose to confess that Jesus is Lord and believe that God raised him from the dead to be saved. So if the wooing of the Spirit of God, according to John 6, you sense and feel that in your life, and you confess based on that drawing of God, you confess that Jesus is the Lord, the Bible would say that you're called. If you choose to reject that wooing of God, the Bible would choose to say that you've not been called. So I would encourage you that if you sense at any time Not just in this service, but in life. God knocking on the door of your heart. Open the door and let him in. And Deuteronomy, speaking of the sovereignty of God, chapter 29, verse 29, here's what Moses wrote. The secret things belong to the Lord our God. God's sovereignty. There'll always be a shroud of mystery wrapped around it this side of heaven until God fully opens our eyes. But we do know this, the elect are called by God. In other words, no one can come to Jesus unless he first draws them, unless he first draws them. Second thing we learn about the elect is the elect are loved by God. Look back in verses one and two, it says to those who've been called who are loved by God, the father and kept for Jesus Christ. It is no mystery How much God loves the church. How much God loves his people. How much God loves you. God loves you so much. He loves me so much. He loves us so much that he sent his very best to make it possible that we could have a relationship with him. He sent Jesus on the greatest recovery trip ever to rescue you and me from our own sin. For God so loved the world 
that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him shall not perish but have eternal life. God's love is best pictured in Jesus. And please understand that that love never ends. I love the prophet Jeremiah's words in Jeremiah 31, 3. God says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you, drawn you with unfailing kindness. God is good. <laughs> and God is gracious. And the only way any of us could be in a right relationship with him is because he first loved us. Romans 5 and 8, but God demonstrated his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God calls his elect. He loves his elect. And it also says the elect are reserved by God. The elect, elect are reserved by God. Look again uh, in verse 3 it, it, as it's going. Or excuse me, verse 2. It says, who are loved by God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. He not only saves us, but he seals us in Christ. It's not our efforts that get us to heaven. Our efforts are evidence that we're going to heaven. Our efforts do not earn us a home in heaven. They're just evidence that we're on the way to heaven, that we really are called by God. It's actually God who completes the work in us. He not only starts it, he continues it, and he completes it. I love the way Paul wrote. In Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 through 6, he starts out by saying, I thank God every time I remember you. In all my prayers all, for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. So we know he's talking to believers, and look at what he writes as he says, I thank him for you in verse 6. He says, being confident of this, that he, that's referring to God, who began a good work in you, will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. So God starts the work of salvation. He carries the work of salvation. And he also completes the work of salvation. He has reserved us. We have a reservation for eternity. That is a home in heaven. And it is because of the work of God in you and the work of God through you. There's nothing that we can do to earn salvation nor to keep salvation, nor to lose salvation. If we have truly received salvation, it is the gift of God, and it's ours by faith, because the work was not only paid in full, but if we translate that to English in the one word, it means it's finished. It means that Jesus did everything that was necessary for us to be right with God. We also see in the passage that the elect are blessed by God. The elect are blessed by God. Look again at the end of verse 2. And it says that we, as the elect of God, receive mercy, peace, and love. Jude actually says that we have it in abundance, that God is so gracious that he gives us what we do not deserve in the way of salvation and also in the way of sanctification. As we're growing up in Jesus, we know that mercy, peace, and love are available for us. Not because we've earned it. Not because we deserve it. If we got what we deserved, we would all be destined to a real place called hell. Because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But he saves us, he seals us, and he also, in the sanctifying work, promises us that we would receive mercy, peace, and love. Now, I want to pause for a moment. Let's not misunderstand this. What that does not say is that life will be easy for the believer. What that does not say is that life will be devoid of challenge for the elect. A verse that... You've heard, not just from me, but others. I remember Dan Heath saying this between songs one Sunday some time ago. There's a promise in the scripture we don't like to claim. It's in John 16 and 33. It says, in this world, you will have trouble. We will. But the rest of that verse, there's also another promise. 
but I've overcome the world. And in me, in me, in me, not in the world, in me, you can have peace. That means when we go through the storms of life, we can be sure that God's mercy, his peace, and his love, whatever we need to honor him through the challenges and the trials of life, God will give his people. First, we see the elect of God. In this passage, we also see, number two, the enemies of God. We, we, this is a tough one. I'll, I'll just be really transparent. We don't like using the word that God has enemies or, or the statement that God has enemies. But the Bible is clear. There comes a time in a person's life where a line is drawn and you either choose God or you reject God. And for those who reject God, once that rejection is final and their heart is hardened, they become an enemy of God, the Bible speaks of. It's a tough one to swallow, but it's in the Scripture itself. And man chooses his own posture. I'll either be a part of the elect by responding to the wooing of the Holy Spirit and trusting Christ, or when I sense that I have an opportunity to choose Christ and I rebel and take the posture of an enemy, then God allows me to live in my choice. We see this. Look at verse 4. Jude says, For certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. they are ungodly people who pervert the grace of God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ our only sovereign Lord. Now, now please understood, Jude was dealing with some misinformation around the topic and the doctrine of grace. In our culture, in our world, even in our city, there's a misunderstanding of what grace actually means. Grace certainly saves, and grace also sanctifies. But there's a misunderstanding in Jude's day, we see in the text, and there's a misunderstanding in our day. As if we live for God means we're trying to earn our way and not depending on grace. But the Bible would teach the contrary, that grace leads us to live from God. Look at verse 4 uh, uh, again. Uh, or excuse me, I'm going to unpack verse 4. Before we do, I, I want to show that God really does call us to consciously choose to live for him every day. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. I'm going to read it. We won't spend a long time there, but I'm going to read it. And I'm going to ask you to go back and spend some time in it later today. And ask God to give you wisdom on these verses. Listen to what Paul says to his writers. As for other matters, brothers and sisters, he had just been talking to them about how to live for Jesus. He says, we instructed you on how to live in order to please God. In fact, you are living. Notice that it says there that we're to live in order to please God. That we're to get up every day and we're to choose to live for God. We can't do it on our own. We need his help. But he says that we're to live for God. And, and he tells the Thessalonians, in fact, you're doing. He says, now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. For you know the instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. Listen to verse 3. It is God's will that you should be sanctified. That you should avoid sexual immorality. Pause here for a moment. There are some say that sanctification is a one-time event. When you're saved, you're made just like Jesus. And yes, when you're saved, you're sanctified, you're made just like Jesus before God. So positionally, we're no longer a sinner. We're saved. But notice Paul in 1 Thessalonians 4 is writing to save people who have positionally been made perfect before God in Christ. And he tells those that are already sanctified positionally to live in a way that you would be sanctified. The verb tense there means that sanctification is a continual process. It's not only a one-time event when we've been made like Jesus the moment we surrender our lives to him. It's a process where we grow up in our faith and become more like Jesus. There are a number of things we read in the New Testament that are already yet not yet. <laughs> it's already happened yet it's not yet happened. Just like you and I have received eternal life if you surrendered your life to Jesus, but yet we're still living in time. We're not in heaven yet. So we've received it, but we will receive it to be absent with the bodies, to be present with the Lord, and we step into eternity to experience eternal life like never before. 
So there are some things that have happened, but not yet happened. Then he continues that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable. We are responsible for learning at the feet of God how he wants us to live. We have to take some personal initiative, some responsibility to say, okay, God, I see what you're saying. I don't know that I can do that. Or or more correctly, I can't do that without your help. Help me live what I'm learning in the scripture. Verse 5, not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God. And that in the ma- this matter, no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother and sister. The Lord will punish those who commit such sins, as we have told you and warned you. There are some who believe, because of grace, that Christians are never punished. In context, this is what discipline would look like. Just like a father would discipline his child if he really loves him, or a mother, her child, if she really loves him, so God disciplines those that he loves says it all through the scripture. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction, listen to this part, does not reject human being, but God, the very God who gives you the Holy Spirit. The moment we take the posture that we know better than God, we step on, a, on the other side of the line from God's family and we become what would be referred to as enemies of God. What do they look like according to Jude in verse 4? There's a lot. Five, I'm going to give them to you very quickly. Number one, the enemies of God are deceitful. Notice it says they secretly slipped in among you. Oftentimes they look a lot like Christians. They sound a lot like Christians, but they're just a little off in their doctrine, and their doctrine leads away from the pure grace of God. They're deceitful. Second thing, the enemies of God are disobedient. Notice in verse 4, and not only does it say they slipped in secretly, it says they're ungodly people. What does that mean? That means that they choose to live apart from the teachings of Christ. That they willfully choose to do things that they know God's word says not to do. They live contrary to God's word. They're deceitful, disobedient. Third thing, they're dangerous. They're dangerous because they pervert the grace of God, and turn it into a license for immorality. That's a form of hedonism. That's when somebody says, hey, because God saved you, you can live however you want to live. Do you hear what that means? You can live however you want to live. That's hedonism. That's when we live according to our own pleasures. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that we would live for God and for his glory. We looked at that a couple of weeks ago in the series Why church? Why? Because we were put here to honor God with our life and our lips. And sometimes what I want does not honor God. Why? Because I'm human. And so are you. And there are going to be times where you want to do something that is contrary to God's word. Then what are you supposed to do? Same thing I'm supposed to do. (laughs) God, forgive me and give me the power Not to chase my wants, but to live for your purpose and for your glory. As we continue through this, we see not only are they dangerous, but they're deniers. The enemies of God are deniers. It says they deny the lordship of Christ. They deny that he is sovereign and that he is Lord. Now now watch this. What what does Lord mean? So if you look it up in the Greek, it's kurios or kurios, depending on how you, which uh, Greek letters you use to spell it. Kyrios or kyrios, they both mean the same. What does that mean? Master. So to confess Jesus as Lord means that he's master, and that means, okay, God, my wants and desires no longer will I follow. If you give me the strength, I will follow your will. So what we see going on in the audience that Jude is addressing, he's writing to people that misunderstand grace in such a way that they use grace as an excuse to live however they want. So they're fulfilling their sinful desires. Can a believer have sinful desires? Yes, we can. We get off focus a little bit. We get out of the word and into the world. And next thing you know, we're walking with one foot on each side of the fence. And let me tell you, that's a painful walk. That's a painful walk. We need to put both feet on the side with Jesus. And when we look over and we're tempted by the world, we need to say, Lord, help me. Lord, help me. And when we fail, and there will be times that we will fail, 
Believers are not exempt from sinning. 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 says, If we, believers, claim not to have sinned, we lie and the truth is not in us. We need his help. And what do we do? What 1 John 1, 9 says, we confess with our sins. <laughs> and he is faithful and just to forgive us and purify us from all unrighteousness. That's John writing to the church. That means we need him. But we first must acknowledge that he is Lord and not deny his sovereign power. Lastly, it says the enemies of God are damned. And you say, does it really say that? That's strong. Look back at verse 4 again. It says, for certain individuals whose condemnation, that means to be damned, whose condemnation was written about long ago. Yes, the enemies of God are damned. That means they're destined to a real place called hell. Unless they were to surrender their life to the Lord Jesus Christ and cross that line of faith and become a part of the elect. Unless they were to respond to the calling of God and be saved and be born again. They are on the wrong side of the line. And the Bible says they are damned. Let, let, me, let me pause here for a moment. Romans chapter 8 verse 1. Please don't ever forget this if you know and love the Lord Jesus Christ. Because there are moments in life we might get off path. Okay? Please don't ever forget this verse. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. If you've surrendered your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, truly, you cannot outrun the grace of God. You cannot outrun the grace of God. Now, that's not a license to go out and live how we want. That's just the fact that, that God that loved us keeps us. His keeping power. We can be sure that our home is heaven. Number three, and we won't go long here because it's pretty uh, self-explanatory. And that is the end with or without God. Look at verses five through seven. Though you already know all this, I want to remind you that the Lord at one time delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their proper dwelling. These he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for the judgment, great day of judgment. In a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They, listen to the last part, that's, a, that's important for us. They serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. Now I want you to do a couple things. I, I would underline or circle eternal. And the reason that is, is there's some who suppose hell is not a real place. Please understand that says that it's eternal. That, that means it's not a burning up and they exist no more and, and there is no more consciousness and hell is the absence of the existence of God. That is not a sound biblical teaching. One cannot exegete the scriptures soundly and come to that conclusion. Hell is a real place. But the good news is, is that there are two choices of where we would spend eternity. In your notes, A, the end of God, or the end with God equals deliverance. If you look back at the beginning of these verses, in verse 5, he says that, I want to remind you that the Lord at one time delivered his people. So the deliverance that God gave his people in the past, he has promised to God's people in the future, that's to you and me as well. That means we will be delivered from the condemnation that others would receive. That damnation is not in our future. Heaven is our home. And it's also our hope. And you can be sure of it in a biblical definition of hope. Because that is when we are sure of the things that we do not see or the things yet to come. Why? Because our hope is not grounded in our effort, but our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me show you a couple things that heaven is a real place. 2 Corinthians 12, 1 through 4 says that heaven is where God dwells, and it's referred to as paradise. Psalm 103, verse 11 says heaven is somewhere above the earth. There, there technically are three heavens, the heavens that we live in today, the second heavens, the stratosphere, and beyond that will be the third heavens according to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 4, and that's where God dwells, and it's somewhere way up there. John 14, 1 through 4, Jesus promised his disciples before ascending into heaven after the resurrection, I'm going to prepare a place for you, a literal place, and I'll come back and get you. And then in Revelation 21, 4, the Bible speaks of this place. There's no more pain. There's no more suffering. There's no more sickness. 
The Bible even says that God will wipe away every tear because we will be filled with a level of joy in his presence that is hard for our minds to conceive. That's the good news. The bad news is that there is an end without God also, and that end equals damnation. Romans 3 and 23 says all have sinned. That means we're all started on the, narrow, uh, the wide road that leads to death. But then it says in Romans 6 and 23 that sin leads to death, but there's a gift that God has sent, and his name is Jesus. And if we turn to Jesus, we escape damnation. But if we do not, we would end up in a real place called hell. Matthew 3 and 12 says it's an unquenchable fire. That's a fire that never goes out. Matthew 25 and 41, Jesus used another word to describe this fire. He said it's eternal, it's unquenchable, and it's eternal. In Revelation 19 and 3, speaking of this place, it said in hell that the smoke goes up forever and ever and ever. Well, if this smoke goes up forever and ever and ever, it's talking about a real place. In Luke 16, 19 through 31, we see those who die without Christ we physically see them in a place that the Bible says is filled with torment, a place of agony, a place of regret, a place where the fire never dies. There's gnawing and gnashing of teeth and there's shame. In Revelation 20, verses 14 through 15, it's referred to as the second death. I heard someone say, hell can't be a real place because when you die, you don't exist anymore. I said, hell is referred to as the second death. Do you know what that means? That means there's a first death. Well, what is the first death? We're all born that way. The Bible says that when we're born, we're born dead in our trespasses, Romans chapter 5. We're born dead in our trespasses. Dead means that we're separated from God. That's what spiritual death means, separated from God. So we're born separated from God. And watch this, John 4 and 4. If we're not born again, we not only remain dead, but the Bible says one day, if we die physically, then we die a second time spiritually. And what does the second death mean? It means to be separated from God, not just in this life, but also for the life to come. So right now, there are dead men walking, as in dead people walking. And you say, what do you mean? They're people who are spiritually dead, and they're walking around. I used to be that guy until I surrendered to Jesus, and so do you, until you surrender to Jesus. If you've not, I encourage you today, 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 surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ and be made alive from the inside out, and then you will live forever. In the passage, we see the elect of God, the enemies of God, and we see the end with or without God. I hope you will choose God.